I'm so excited to take you guys on a tour of the chef's garden. It's a regenerative farm out in Ohio. Um, I first had Dr. Amy Sapola, who is their pharmacist with an F. She is a very accomplished pharmacist, actually, who came over into uh, the wellness side of things and was on the podcast talking about regenerative farming. And I was very excited to meet these guys because it can sometimes be hard to find regenerative produce. And these guys actually ship to people's homes, which is super cool. And so they invited me out to check out the farm. I was just blown away. So in this episode, we're going to tour not only the farm and we're going to hear from Bob Jones, one of the partners of the owners. So uh, Lee Jones, some of you guys know, might know uh, farmer Lee Jones, and then his brother, Bob Jones Jr. Um, are the two owners of the chef's garden. And so I got to interview Bob. What an amazing man. I was so impressed with him from just a leadership standpoint and just a good human standpoint. Um, and we also got to tour their actual research facility that they have on the farm. Um, so really cool. So they're testing the mineral content of their soils, of their plants. Um, we got to go to their microgreens, which just blew me away. And also um, the culinary vegetable and Institute. So uh, chef Jamie Sampson is the chef there and people come from all over to learn from chef Jamie because really they're kind of known as like the, you know, the nose to tail people. They're like the nose to tail plant people. So it's about eating all parts of the plants. Um, so really cool. We, we, uh, chef Jamie showed us the bees. Um, we got to go through his little edible garden. It looks like a decorative garden that like, it's just a beautiful landscaping, but it's all edible. It was so cool and so fun. Um, so, um, I'm excited to educate you guys today. Uh, we also talked to the soil health specialist there. And so I'm going to show you guys around everything that I learned all about regenerative farming and what you might not know. And um, make sure that you check them out. It's the chefsgarden.com. We'll put all the links, everything in the show notes. Um, and yeah, let's go on a little journey. You ready? <laughs> Welcome to Farmer Jones Farm Farm Market. Bob, thank you so much for coming out and talking about soil health, planetary health, human health. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about how you guys got here as a, you know, in Ohio, you're surrounded by corn, beans, and wheat, corn, beans, and wheat. Exactly. So how did this happen? You know, what was the story for your family? We've been vegetable growers all of our life. And uh, Dad started growing vegetables in the early 60s, even into the late 50s a little bit, mm. and grew his business. He became a very large wholesale grower. Um, it was, we talk a lot about how in the United States today, agriculture is broken, both economically and agronomically. Mm. And we were a microcosm of that in our family. Mm. Dad's business grew uh, to about 1,200 acres of wholesale vegetables. And he was selling uh, semi-loads of fresh produce. We would load 10 or 15 loads every day. Mm. He had a large retailer in the Midwest that was his biggest customer. Um, they were 120-day uh, pay. Mm. So it was, you know going on six months before you got your money. Wow. At the same time, the, the, the model back in the 80s and still employed today is that farmers will borrow operating capital in the winter. Mm -hmm. You'll farm all season long in hopes that you have a great year and you can pay that back. And then you massage the books and you go back to the bank and you beg for more operating money for the next season. Dad's last operating note was 23% interest. Wow. And his largest customer was 120 day pay. And we wondered why that didn't work. Wow. We were borrowing money at 23%. We were loaning it at 0%. 
And agronomically, at the same time, we were seeing that it was requiring greater and greater amounts of inputs to produce the same or less outputs. Wow. So something was off. We yeah. really didn't understand what it was. Wow. Our farm went through several evolutions. We, we lost the farm in 1983. We went from 12 acres in 83 to 6 acres in 1984. Wow. We were a large wholesale, so it was economics 101. Large volume, low margin, wait for your money. To 6 acres of retail. So it was a farm market, roadside stand and farmer's markets. Mm -hmm. It was much lower volume, but higher margin, mm -hmm. cash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that economic model worked. Right. While we were at farmer's markets, we ran into some chefs. There were chefs in the Cleveland area that could not get good quality produce from their normal vendors. So they started coming to the farmer's market to buy produce. And their business grew and grew. And one chef introduced us to another who introduced us to another. And after about four or five years of doing farm markets and chefs, we had to make a decision. We chose to go with the chefs. And then Lee went out and found every chef he could find. And Dad and I figured out how to grow the stuff. The chefs were very, very consistent in their requirements. Flavor, aesthetics, flavor, shelf life, and more flavor. What we started growing and selecting varieties and growing specifically for flavor. What we didn't know 30 years ago was that as we were selecting for varieties and growing for flavor that we were dragging nutrition along kicking and screaming <laughs> right you know color is nutrition color is flavor that just wasn't our target it was an un unintended consequence here <laughs> imagine we are. that yeah F food that tastes good is nutritious that's you know, we talk crazy of, the best example that i can think of is the burger king tomato <laughs> if it weren't round and red, you wouldn't know the darn thing was a tomato. Nope. The yeah. box it comes in has more fiber than the tomato. <laughs> but everybody recognizes that. And actually, right. tomato breeders around the world did exactly what the industry asked them to do. Right? Grow for consistency of size and shape and shipping characteristics. Wow. So that that tomato could withstand a ride right. from Mexico to New York City. Right. Right. They did exactly what the industry asked them. Flavor was left out of the equation. And now here we are growing heirloom varieties on healthy soil because the darn things actually taste good they and taste people so will good. eat them. They taste so good. I just had one of your pineapple tomatillos uh, tomatillo. say, unreal, life-changing. It's, like, it's like candy. Candy. I was like, is it going to be rude if I just start binge eating these in front of them? <laughs> or, Yeah. And, and even the tomatoes I had last night, you know, these beautiful heirloom tomatoes, it was like, I, I literally felt sad. I literally felt sad. I mean, I felt grateful and I also felt sad because I was like, no wonder people aren't eating healthy food natural foods because they don't normally taste like this. It was like every pleasure center in my brain was like, yum, you know? And I was like, think about how much more kids would eat vegetables if they tasted that way. Right. And on top of the taste, like you talk about dragging nutrition with it, like you're not just guessing on that. You actually know, you guys actually have a research facility here where you're looking, you're, you're curious, like how nutrition, how does this compare to the stuff that was grown in Mexico and driven across borders? Can you share a little bit about sure. like, why, why did you start doing that? How did that come about and what have you found? Well, we, we certainly are curious and the curiosity is really what has driven the business. So we had a customer base who was looking for flavor and shelf life mm. and we set about to try and learn how to accomplish that, how to meet and exceed customer expectation. Yeah. And so we built a, a very crude lab that preceded this one. It was in an old truck, semi-truck awesome. that was set on the ground. <laughs> and we started looking at soil health. We started looking at plant genetics. Mm. So we don't use any GMOs or genetically modified, but we do... Uh, employ genetic selection. So we'll plant a hundred varieties of a specific tomato and we will select out the 10 healthiest plants mm. and we'll save seed from those 10 and then we'll do it again and self-select again. Wow. And we will do variety trials with chefs wow. and let them tell us which awesome. is their favorite tomato. Amazing. 
but figuring out how to grow this stuff and then correlating our growing methodologies to soil health, uh, plant health, and then human health. Now we're correlating that back as we learn more and more about rotation and cover crop and fallow. We're using multi-species cover crops. So when we plant cover crop on a piece of land that is not going to get vegetables this year, we will plant 10 to 12 different species of cover crop in that planting. Diversity is beneficial in life. Yep. Now, you can employ that a hundred different ways. Mm -hmm. Every plant species is a host to a different range of bacteria and fungi in the soil. So if you have one crop, you get a very narrow band of biology that is, right. is being supported by that plant root exudate. If you plant 10 to 12, you have a diversity of plant species, a diversity of microbiological life, and you can actually unlock legacy minerals that are in the soil. Hmm. We're about three miles from Lake Erie. We have a real problem in Lake Erie with algal bloom as a result of phosphorus and nitrogen runoff of ag land. Now, Ag isn't the only contributor to this. There are others as well, but ag is the primary one. We have more phosphorus, legacy phosphorus, in our soils than we need to grow any crop we grow. It's just not in the right chemical form to mm -hmm. be available to a plant. Plants need mm -hmm. nitrogen. Plants need phosphorus. Mm -hmm. If you can unlock that mm -hmm. legacy mineral in the soil, you don't have to supplement it with... Right. Um, Petroleum-based fertilizers, yeah. okay? That's where most of our fertilizers come from, our petroleum derivatives. We didn't use uh, man-made amendments in agriculture until after World War II. There were lots of chemicals being made for the war effort that were no longer needed post-World War II, and they started using them in agriculture. Yeah. If they put these certain chemicals on the field, the weeds didn't grow. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, let's do that. I read, I got curious who cre was the original creator of glyphosate, and it was the guy who created the gas for the gas chambers in Nazi Germany, literally, was the chemical genius that they created glyphosate for. I was like, go figure. Right. <laughs> so what we've learned over the years is that maybe some of those practices that we employed early on yeah. in modern agriculture aren't the best for us. <laughs> so, yeah. you know... We tend to look at natural processes. And how do we accentuate natural processes? Multi-species cover crop, mm -hmm. healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy people, healthy planet. Mm -hmm. When we're planting a multi-species cover crop, we can sequester 10 times the amount of carbon from the atmosphere as a mature forest. Wow. So we're pulling carbon from the air and putting yeah. it in soil organic carbon, and we're using that... Uh, native phosphorus, native legacy nitrogen to grow that crop. Hmm. Um, but this, when the soil becomes healthier, the plant becomes healthier, and that makes product, the, the food, the end result, taste better and be more nutrient dense. Yeah. It all works together right. when we better understand natural processes and then leverage nature. Yes. We're really all about energy. So plants through photosynthesis are converting light energy to chemical energy. As a, in general, plants use about 50% of the photosynthetic energy that they produce. The rest is excreted out through the roots into the soil and becomes a food source for that microbiological life mm -hmm. in the soil. Mm -hmm. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the plant and the organism in the soil. We work a lot with photosynthetic efficiency. How do we create an optimum environment for those microbes to live in the soil and feed them? You know, microbes are no different than you and I. If we're getting enough rest, we're eating right, mm -hmm. and we're getting a little bit of rest, mm -hmm. our bodies perform better. Right. Microbes are the exact same way. If they're getting the food, if they're getting the rest, so don't plant a crop on it every year. Let it set fallow. But when it's fallow, multi-species cover crop to feed that soil, not just barren. We don't want right. bare soil ever because you're now you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere right. versus sinking carbon in. Right. 
Right. Not we have learned a lot. And, and probably the most important thing we've learned, Tara, is how little we know. <laughs> you don't know how much you have to know just in order to know how little you know. <laughs> Well said. Yeah. And I, you know, I took a little stroll through your property over by your culinary veg, vegetable institute, it's called, correct? And, you know, Amy told me, told me I could walk through there and it's very just heavily dense plants everywhere. And I just, as I was walking through, I just thought we're making it so hard on ourselves. Like I saw a, a orange leaf fall off a tree and right in front of me and hit the ground. And I thought, Nature just takes care of it. Nature's like, okay, you lived your life. Now you're going to turn back into compost. You're going to feed the soil and the microbes, and then we're going to grow again. And it's just the cycle that just takes care of itself. And I understand that we, you know, we intervene sometimes because we want to grow. But the way you guys are doing it is you're mimicking nature. You're saying, how does nature do it? And how can we, how can we help? How can we be stewards and assist in this process versus completely removing ourselves from the natural processes, which is a lot of what we've done. You know, some people are a little bit, uh, they, they think it was malice and maybe it was on how I, I look at it as I don't think we realized what we were doing, you know, and now, like, as you said, we've learned more and I'm curious as you've gone through this price process of, okay, unlocking these minerals, uh, you know, uh, not to mention the water conservation that's got to happen from mm-hmm. having these cover crops, you know, not having the ground super hot by having the cover crops. What have you guys learned in terms of, um, the nutrient density of the plants? Well, certainly, any time that you grow and utilize a natural process, everything becomes better. Mm -hmm. So our soils have the ability to regenerate Mm -hmm. and heal themselves Mm -hmm. if we follow the natural processes. Isn't it amazing? Our bodies are exactly the same way. Our bodies can heal themselves and regenerate themselves if they're getting the same things that the soil is getting. It's getting proper food, enough hydration, and rest. Yeah. That's when we tend to, to get sick is when we're run down, we're not eating properly, right. we're not exercising enough, right. and our body's tolerances are, and our resistance to disease is lessened, right. and then the disease overcomes. It's survival of the fittest, yeah. right? right? Whichever is dominant, right? In soil... It's aerobic bacteria or anaerobic bacteria. And you want you want anaerobics, but at about 10 to 1. A little bit of stress is good. Too much stress, Absolutely. not good. Exactly. <laughs> and so understanding these natural processes brings along the flavor and the nutritional density. Yeah. As chefs 30 years ago asked us to grow the most flavorful produce that we could possibly find, we had no idea that we were dragging Nutrition along, right. kicking and screaming. Right. Eat the rainbow. Yeah. Color is flavor. What we have learned in our lab is that, you know, when you get the reds and the red lettuces and you get those phenols and the phytonutrients and, and you get things so important to the regeneration of our health that we've lived so long and, and, and consumed so much highly processed food that... All of those good things are processed right out of our food. And then we wonder why, as that nutritional (laughs) density has fallen, human health maladies have increased. And they're almost an inverse relationship. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why that is so. We, We have the cheapest per capita spending of any industrialized nation in the world on food. And we have the highest per capita spending of any industrialized nation in the world on healthcare. There's a direct correlation. 100%. We are paying for our cheap food. Yeah, right. And we're, it's killing us. 100% word that I heard somebody say once, we're the first, for the first time in human history, we are overfed and, and malnourished. We have obese people dying of malnutrition in our right, country. Right, right. You know, and it's, I, I always tell my clients and people that I talk to, to be a nutrient hunter. If you can look at nutrition that way, just hunt how many nutrients can I get into my body? It just gets so easy. Well, like your it, body will sort it out and it will pull what right, it needs. Right, right. Plants are the exact same way. Mm. The plants need different minerals at different stages of growth. Mm-hmm. It's amazing mm. how that plant knows what it needs when it needs it. And that's when it will absorb wow. those minerals. Wow. Exactly when that plant needs it. Whether it's early in its life stage whether it's producing a flower, wow. whether it's producing a seed. 
Mm. It will pull different amounts of energy from photosynthesis wow. or from the soil. Wow, I it's, never thought about that. That the plants are intuitive. It's kind of like you know, I, as an example, I love sweet potatoes. A lot of my friends know that I just love sweet potatoes, and I also love chickpeas or gar- garbanzo beans. And I did a hair mineral analysis and found out that I was low in manganese, right? And so I got curious. Two of the highest sources of manganese, sweet potatoes and chickpeas. I was like, ah, no wonder I wanted my body's like, eat those, please. Right. Eat it's, those. It's you know, telling and the you plants, what it needs. And the plants are doing that too. Absolutely. They're intuitive with what they need. And if the soil is healthy and if you have right. the, the soil balanced nutritionally, then the plant can grow and thrive. Mm. That's why it's so... We talk a lot about here on the farm that soils are the most important crop we grow. Mm. Healthy soils, healthy plants, mm. healthy people, healthy mm. planet. Mm. Yeah, I, if, I've, I'm a geek on this, so I don't know if you've seen, um, uh, what's that soil documentary? Now it's escaping Kiss the me. Ground. Kiss the Ground. Mm. You know, and if you guys haven't seen that, I definitely recommend, you know, watching Absolutely. that one. But it's, it's all about that and helping us understand that, like, we are all one. We are all connected, right? And we forget that sometimes. We, Our chicken is the same thing as a cheese it And it's like, no, <laughs> it's not the same thing. And the more we can increase the biodiversity, that I think for me, like, I feel like I have very good gut health. And I think the reason why is because I eat so many different things, right? And I try to eat as n- nutritionally dense as possible. I, you know, minerals, vitamins, I'm hunting for it always. And I'm like, here you go, body, you're going to love this. And I think as we get into that mindset, and that's why I really appreciate, I was telling you, I was telling Amy, I really appreciate what you guys have done because for those of us who understand that we don't want to eat empty foods anymore. We want to eat foods that are nutritionally dense. And I have four kids and I know as a parent, it's like, I'm trying to give them, they're going to eat the talkies and have Mountain Dew at their friend's house. And it's just, it's going to happen, you know? But for me, what I'm trying to show them is like, See how you feel when you eat this thing that's full of nutrients. Cut this up yourself. Connect with it, you know, and get those nutrients in your body. I feel like if we have the nutrients in place, we have that diversity, we have all the things our body needs, they can deal with the stressors stressors better. But when you're missing key vitamins, key minerals, those stressors become big. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing. The, and I love, I just, I can't get over, I love that it, came as a byproduct of just trying to make your vegetables taste really good. It's just, I love it, you know, and I appreciate what you guys have done and just decades, decades of, of just consistently, how can we improve this? How can we improve this? You know, because it's vital for planetary health. I, I hope that there are other farmers, (laughs) you know, that might come across this episode that are inspired by it because there's a huge need for it. There's a lot of people who want it. You know, and I, I, I also appreciate that the shutdown kind of pushed you guys into a place where you're now delivering to the general public, you know. <laughs> because Everything happens for a reason. Yeah. And if we're lifelong learners, we don't have this figured out <laughs> by a long stretch. But we've learned enough to excite us yeah. to go further faster. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, there are not very many farms in the United States today that are farming regeneratively. No. I believe, we believe very strongly that this will be market-driven. Yes. As more and more consumers say, we will not support highly processed food and hollow calories any longer. Yep. Political vote matters that much in the state of Utah. I'm just going to be real. (laughs) I know which way it's going to go every time, you know. But with my dollar, every single time that I say, I'm behind this. I, I vote for this and it's, it's at least $10, $20, $100 away from the things that I don't want to have happen anymore, you know? And if, if we're against, I think, I think all of us are against the CAFOs, you know, the, the the animal feed lots and the, just we're, if you're tired of this, it's like show up, you know? And I know not everybody, I don't know. I, I actually have mixed feelings about the money thing because for example, your wonderful people here gave me a delicious box of carrots and greens and uh, rainbow shard and eggs and, and just all sorts of wonderful things. And I, I cooked up a feast this morning. I just, I mean, I was chopping up everything, potatoes, squashes, and I'm frying them all up. And I'm like, I look like I barely dented into this box. I just cooked like a huge <laughs> amount of food for like a family. And, and I look like I barely touched this. And I think when you look at it that way, if you're eating real food like that, that's nutrient dense, 
instead of eating out, I think it's cheaper. I really do. I do think that most people could make that shift in the way they're eating. And, and like you said before about healthcare, it's like down the road, not only do you get to live a higher quality of life, like you just feel better all the time, you'll probably make more money because you're going after goals in life because your brain works and your body's thriving. And then on top of it, you're not having to pay for all this healthcare in the end. Like, I think it's, I literally think it's less expensive to live that way, you know? And I think it's a mindset switch that people have to have. But if, if you want to push into eating higher quality food, it's like, okay, don't go to McDonald's. Don't go to fast food. Don't eat out for lunch. Like make some of this stuff, bring it with you and just watch. Cause I feel, I eat that way. And I feel like I spend less money on food than most people. When I go out to a lunch, if I take my kids, I'm like, that was $60 and we're going to be done right here. I could have gotten a whole huge amount of regenerative meat or vegetables and made endless meals with that, you with know? The same so a lot of dollars. With the same amount of dollars, you know, and it's way more nutrient density and it's time at home. And so I'm, I'm calling you guys out. I'm, I'm making a push for it because the more we support people who are doing what you're doing, the more the other people who are doing the things that we're not super big fans of, they start paying attention. They're like, oh, well that, I mean, I guess I'll just do that since that's a more profitable business model. Right. Right. And so that is where we have the power to actually make a difference. And I'm grateful to you guys because I don't want to be a farmer. I don't want to be a rancher. Uh, thank you for doing it. Thank you for doing it. You know, and the least I can do is support so that right. I can have access to those things. Cause otherwise I got to do it all myself and I don't really want to do that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Really appreciate your yeah. interest in what we're doing. We're very passionate about what we yeah. do. We love what we do. Yeah. We like Shows. to talk about it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's amazing to us. Um, the amount of interest that people are having today in it. Even we're talking to insurance companies now mm. and talking about awesome. preventative care awesome. and early detection and then uh, early detection of, of coronary disease and getting people on high nitrate leafy greens nice. for nitric oxide production right? and being able to prevent um, and in some cases reverse coronary disease. Amazing. It's all work that's been done by the medical professionals. We know carrots and lettuce, right? but we know that they taste good. We know we've been able to verify that, that certainly the, the closer to consumption or the closer to harvest that you consume, the better off it is. But there's a difference in the varieties and how things are grown to make it healthier for you. Mm. And that's really our life's goal is mm-hmm. to create an opportunity for folks who are really passionate, as passionate about this as we are, to have a ready access where we can grow it and and wash it and package it right here on the farm and it can be at your doorstep the next morning. It's amazing. Thank you for creating that. That it's it's so and it's I, I you, uh, Amy shipped me one of your boxes, so thank you so much. And it, I cannot tell you like when my kids open that, but they were so excited about it. We did everything stopped. Everybody stopped and just started cutting up stuff, tasting stuff. Like it was this, um, bonding experience. Right. And they wanted to try cooking them. And so just encourage you guys to just try one of their boxes seriously and get your kids involved because they, they were so excited about it. They were eating it, you know, and it's, I mean, you're You've got eggplants that are this big. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's fun. It's literally fun, you know? So thank you for creating it. Thank you for making it accessible people like us i was beyond excited to find out about you guys i was just like they've got the plants i can't find regenerative plants anywhere they got them and they'll ship them to your door the next day i was losing my mind so thank you thank you for the work that you put in thank you for having me here thank you for sharing with us i beyond grateful thank you appreciate you coming out we're growing things that, that sh- maybe shouldn't exist in northeast ohio but uh wow. All right, so this is just like a decorative landscaping yeah. project, right? It's not really, no. It's all edible. All it's the whole thing, you know. It's everything. A, uh, yeah, there's like a, there's like a, I don't know, hundreds of plants in this thing. Um, it's definitely an experiment. We're growing things that that sh- maybe shouldn't exist in Northeast Ohio, but uh, wow. But it's cool. Like this. Literally everything. You yeah. Can see these red. 
Yeah, so this Lovely like flowers. you know, this is a plant you see as like, you know, in a decorations right. and like um, you know, and, and things. It's you know, it's celosia. It's related to spinach, um, beets, amaranth, quinoa, all those plants, they're all in the same family. You know, this thing it's not delicious. These things, they're really great. You know, they're kinda like like spinach and beet greens had a had a baby or something. And look, come on this side and just look down at that stem. Like, it's a flat fern, wow. like crazy stem. That is crazy. Um, just peel that, blanch it, treat it like a vegetable. Yeah, the plant's uh, What's this one called again? Celosia. Wow, beautiful too. Uh, yeah, you know, com like, un I guess it's a common name or it would be like coxcomb. Okay. So, like you can see like the rooster crest, you know, the crest right. to the guy. You know. oh, that's cool. What's it's this red stuff right here? So that's... Celosia also. It's amaranth. It's much more closely related to amaranth. Okay. It'll produce like these tiny little seeds and we're not quite there yet. Uh, those seeds will pop like popcorn. Okay. Uh, smaller than quinoa, smaller than hmm. kaniwa. Wow. The experiment in this bed was to write CVI in big letters, <laughs> but you know, plant, plants are plants and uh, it didn't work. <laughs> Sweet potatoes. Uh, we love this plant. The whole plant is edible. Yeah, I just tried this earlier today. It is incredibly good. Yeah, so people don't think about like, you know, you can think about this. So you got like a dozen or so sweet potatoes planted here. Um, well, that's going to turn into, you know, maybe a few dozen sweet potatoes. But ultimately, throughout the year, the summer months, the, before this plant's done, you have this. It's a healthy green. Like, there's a ton of food uh, on this plant. This is your sort of root to tip of uh nose to tail of, of of the vegetable world yeah you'll see this throughout this entire garden every single stage of the plant's life offers something unique to the plate we want to celebrate that we highlight it we try and identify plants that you know that that play in that same sandbox how can people find out about more of you know which leaves of plants are edible we just spent three and a half years of our life writing a book to help people answer that question. Nice. You know, the, the Chef's Garden Guide to Common and Unusual Vegetables mm. is really written for that purpose. It doesn't really talk about sweet potatoes so much. It talks about the leaves. You know, we, we also highlight unusual varieties of sweet potatoes and, like, unusual things to do with them. But, but that concept is applied to 600 other varieties of vegetables throughout the 1,000-page book. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, think of how much food we're wasting here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the thing. Uh, like, a farmer grows a zucchini plant, right? Um, he's got this big, beautiful plant, and he picked that zucchini to fit in the box, you know, that fits on the pallet, that fits on the truck, that fits in the refrigerator or at the warehouse somewhere, who knows where, that ultimately will, will land to you. He's He's not a bad farmer. He's not a bad guy. He's doing the job. He picks the perfect zucchini that fits in the box. The whole plant's edible. The limb, the, 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 the leaves, the stems, the blooms, the seeds, the pollen, the roots, the whole thing. Um, the fruit, obviously. And at every stage of that fruit, right? You probably saw it on the farm today. The little ones, like the medium ones, the big ones, the big ones. A zucchini will turn into like a pumpkin if you let it, right? It'll get a hard shell. You know, really weird, porous, spongy flesh and these hard seeds. Are, it's cool. It's a different animal. It's still edible. Yeah. It's just, you know, different. Hmm. Maybe interesting here. I don't know. This is beautiful. So, this is Malabar spinach. It's not like, you know, botanically spinach, but we call it spinach. The leaves are like juicy and oh. full of moisture and they produce these berries they're beautiful um, they taste like spinach they don't taste like wow. you know, they don't taste like berries but they're great i love this plant a lot i love its uh, stem i love the leaves i love the blooms i love the fruit i love the whole plant are any of these uh plants that your chefs commonly use or yeah. are these all pretty rare yeah yeah so this would be like like some of these ingredients are things that like you'll see that we will send to restaurants you know mm -hmm. around the the country 
Um, you know, in some cases, it's, you know, just the tent rope, right? And you might see, right. like, a, a package or a container of those, and sometimes it's, it's the big leaves, right? And this is, this is the key, really, to the chef's garden. I said we grow 600 varieties or so of vegetables, but within that, there's 10,000 skews, right? And so at any time, you're managing 10,000 living, breathing, growing skews, uh, that are supposed to be replicable, right? If I can put this on my menu, I need it tomorrow too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, wow. In some cases, it's not possible. You know, this is why I love a walk through the garden because you can find little moments that just won't exist tomorrow yeah. and you put that thing on a plate and that's the dish, you know, that's Amazing. the story. It's great. Wow. What about this guy? This red... Yeah, this is, um, oh, let me think about that one for a second. Oh, so this is perilla. Um, it's related to um, shiso or basil. It's in the mint family. Yeah, it looks like it. One way, you know, you can tell if something's in the mint family is just to get a cross-section of the stem. If it's square, it's in the mint family. Easy, to, pretty easy to identify whether you're out in the woods in the fields, like hmm. in a nursery or wherever. Good to know. Square stem, mint family. Doesn't smell like mint. Doesn't taste like mint. Doesn't taste like basil. Doesn't taste like shiso. Um, but they're really beautiful. Wow. You see, these are these are butterfly pea blossoms. Um, these we use in tea. They're pH sensitive. So if you make a tea with this, it'll it'll brew blue. You add lemon, it turns pink. Um, very gorgeous. It's really a cool plant. It's a little Japanese bonsai uh, oh, wow. prickly ash. Can it eat it? Yeah, it's. It makes your mouth numb. Um, it's kind of um, it's kind of an unusual, beautiful sensation. Your mouth will water. It gets like kind of cold water itself appears colder than it is you know it's a really interesting beautiful plant that's tastes unlike anything else in this garden wow is there one yeah. you'll taste it for four or five minutes it's great yeah it's kind of cool basil here and there Voluntary. Uh, let's see. One of the one of our jobs here, you know, at the Culinary Vegetable Institute, is really to give people a better understanding of like diversity, um, where their food comes from, who grows it, how's it being grown. In this industry, it's so often you're cooking at home and something calls for mint, you just get mint. Right? And here's a mint garden, and there's maybe 16 or 17 varieties of mint here. Right? And then you get to ask the question, what kind of mint? You know, you're working through that dish, or you're making the cocktail, or you're doing whatever, dessert, and it's not just the ubiquitous mint. You know, it's all about diversity, you know, and now we have mint that tastes like the apples and chocolate and you know lemons and you know like menthol and spearmint and peppermint it's pretty cool it's like a, a dish calling for meat yeah sure <laughs> exactly. that's exactly right that's exactly right add meat add meat <laughs> uh, gee these are all great I want you to just smell them it's going to be hard to convey it on the camera but you want to kind of rough this leaf up a little bit it's and what is this this is a uh, verbena mm. it's a uh, oh I can smell it from yeah, here it's crazy it's beautiful mm, amazing you know it's the same compounds that's in a box of fruit loops yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's the same that's crazy
Those light green ones and the dark purple are both sweet potato, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they different varieties of sweet potato? Mm -hmm. Just that's it? Yeah, so this this light green leaf is a um, like an orange skin, orange flesh, Beauregard, southern style mm -hmm. sweet potato. Mm -hmm. And then this longer purple leaf, it's a purple skin, orange flesh flesh variety of sweet potato. They're pretty prolific. They grow very well here. They don't require much maintenance. Mm. Is this a squash, these big dinosaur plant looking things? Yeah, let's get in it. Come, <laughs> come on in. You're not going to hurt anything over here. Can you see that guy? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. It used to be a zucchini. It just grew too no, long. No, yeah, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my baby. I'm working on this. I'm working on this one. That's amazing. This giant pumpkin. It's not. Every year I try and plant a giant pumpkin. Uh, this year it got away from me. So hey, we fresh. have pumpkin soup. Super pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> yes. oh, the lavender smells amazing. Any guess? Any guesses? Uh, can I smell it first? Absolutely. You're not gonna recognize no, it. No, it's kind of lemony smelling. I don't know what it is though. Yeah. It's an interesting plant. This is one of the few things you get to see in the grocery store in multiple aisles, right? Uh, in the spice section, it's known as fennel seed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, in the produce section. You get the bulb. Oh, this is just fennel? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, it's all just young, bolted wow. fennel. What's this over here? This lush green. So this plant is um, related to the cucumber, um, the pumpkin, the squash. They're all in the same family, but it doesn't make a melon or a mm. fruit. It makes this flower that's so precious to the bees. Um, Kind of a star-shaped blossom. I'll pull one right there. And they hang upside down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The bees go crazy for these things. Um, it's called borage. Mm. And the borage blossom tastes like, kind of like melon, cucumber, seaweed. <laughs> Interesting. I don't know if you can capture it, but while we're here, the flower hangs upside down because it's designed for the pollinator. When the bee jumps off of the flower, it flicks back up and drops pollen mm -hmm. on the bee's belly. So when it goes on to the next flower, it's naturally pollinating. Wow. Watch, you'll see the flower flick back up. Right when it comes off, it just flicks off. It's very cool. Wow. If they start by laying eggs, this gate will be wide open. But until they start laying eggs, they're going to establish this place as home. And you know, their favorite thing, high protein, nutrient dense mealworms. Oh, wow. Amazing. So no grains for these guys? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love grains too. Oh yeah, they're pretty excited about that. These little crickets. Why not? Do you know off the top of your head who produces what color eggs? No, not yet. <laughs> so these are all bantams. Um, there, there will always be small chickens. Oh, okay. um, they'll never be like those big, you know, big massive chickens. But the, you know, they lay. They lay small eggs with big yolks, and I think they'll be great for the breakfast baskets in the, you know, in the suite upstairs. Mm. Chickens are also a great way to, like, you know, work through some of those kitchen scraps, you know, the, yeah. the peels and the leaves and things like that. Uh, right now, they're young. We're just trying to get them comfortable with people. Do you see this fluffy one with the yeah. with the backwards feathers over yeah. there? She's pretty fabulous. <laughs> Her feathers are always like that? Or yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Nice. 
These feathers. So that's the one rooster, the black guy over there. He's a he's a black Sumatra. He's beautiful. When he's full grown, he's like got like a two foot long tail. He's a really cool bird. Yeah, we do it like twice a day. We'll come out and just do a little bit of like this kind of handling just to, you know, keep them. Yeah. Great. And they, you know, twice a day you have to clean that because they kick straw into it. Twice a day. Two times. True. Right, it's like this little, like, different shape. And the only difference between the egg from this cell and this cell is the shape of the. So you'll see um, there's 31 beehives in this yard and you see notice they're all facing the same direction right and they're all protected from the same side in the same direction right and that the, the, the basic reason for that is Lake Erie in Canada is that way and sunrise is that way so when the Sun comes up over these trees the first thing these hives see is you know the morning, right? The first thing that these boxes get is sunlight. And that's important because any flower, any flower produces its nectar first thing in the morning, right? And you'll see bees coming out in the morning. Ideally, you want to get them out as early as possible because that's when the flowers are producing the most nectar. Does that make sense? It's good for me. It's good for the bees. It's good for, it's good for the world. It's good for the vegetables. It's good for everything. On this property, we grow 65 varieties of edible flowers and we keep them on at all times, right, throughout the year. From the very beginning part of the spring, we try and have an abundance of flowers from now all the way to the end. We're also on the river, the Huron River. That's important because these bees drink a ton of water. Um, people don't think about that. They're thirsty. You know, they need water. So we, we're right on the a peninsula. We're 100 acres here, mostly wooded, uh, with 31 hives and 65 varieties of edible flowers throughout the year. You'll see things like clover honey and buckwheat honey and orange blossom and whatever honey, uh, you know, uh, in stores. We can't do that because of the biodiversity here. You know, we're not a monoculture or a monocrop. We're not one big farm with one big kind of plant. You know, we're, we have a ton of different plants here. We celebrate that. You can taste it in the honey. The bee that goes out to bring back nectar from the flowers, she's not the same bee that puts it in the comb, right? And that's pretty cool because now you have, you've got some bees up here, right? This is where the honey production is. But you've got some bees up here that, you know, are responsible for like storage, right? They're just like the closet keepers. They're the ones organizing and folding the sheets and stuff. They're basically the, the worker bee that goes out, she gets the nectar, she comes back, she gives it to another bee that then like organizes it in the hive. And that's cool because then you find these pockets in the in the comb. You know, you'll, you'll dig into there and, you know, one tastes like mint and another one might taste like like lavender and another one might taste like hyssop and another one might taste like nasturtium for some reason. You know, it's cool. Um, side by side by side in the same frame, you know, you can taste different pockets of honey. It's pretty awesome. Um, there's only one queen in each one of these colonies, right? So you've got 31 hives, that means 31 queens. 31 queens have got to do their work. We start at about 10,000 bees in the spring, and right around this time of year, we're wrapping up at, I don't know, 60,000, 70,000 bees per box. Uh, so times 35, as you tell me. The bees themselves are mostly females. Um, if I see one, I'll point one out, but there's a few male bees per hive. Their job is to like really wait and hope for the scent of a pheromone of a virgin queen flying in the sky that they can then meet way up there, breed with, and then die. Like, that's their whole job, if they're lucky. 
Right, and the, the, the likelihood of that even happening is not likely. But in the fall, right about now, the male bee population diminishes to zero because the chance of that happening in the winter is not likely, impossible. Basically, these worker bees, the females, they drag the male out of the hive, they chew their wings off and drop them out in the grass somewhere, and that's, that's it. So it's done. you don't want to be a male bee, you don't want to be a male bee in the, in the fall. Uh, for the rest of them, they have different jobs. You've got some that you know go out and find honey, and then they come back and they tell the other bees where that honey is, and then the worker bees will go out and hit that until there's no more nectar available. Uh, some bees, their job is to scout for a potential home, right? In the event that, that let's say, the, the hive catches on fire, they've got to fly off uh, and they have to have a backup plan. They try to keep those, uh, those pretty, pretty well. Some bees' job is to just tend to the queen. And that's pretty cool. You've got these like basically assistant bees just like feeding the queen all day long. She'll lay over her body weight a day in larvae. That's pretty crazy, right? Imagine giving birth to something over your body weight every day. Um, so she needs like a lot of food, you know, a lot of food. There's three or four bees helping her out with that. Is the queen like a specific different kind of bee? Like how does it become the queen? That's a great question. The queen is, okay, so here's, here's how this will work. Imagine you're, you're a queen bee and you're going from cell to cell. There's a thousand cells in each side of honeycomb in this box. She's going from cell to cell and she's laying eggs all day long. Well, one of these cells is shaped different than the others. This one special little cell, it's called a queen cup. The queen cup, then the other bees go around her and they build that egg out and that cell out into this larger thing. It almost looks like an upside down morel mushroom, right? It's like this little, like, different shape. And the only difference between the egg from this cell and this cell is the shape of the cell and the amount of time and protein that egg was given to develop. So because it has more space, it has more time, it's got more time, it's got more food, royal jelly they call it. And that bee, which very easily could have been a worker bee or a male bee or any other bee, uh, just happens to emerge as a queen. While these worker bees will live four to six months in the summer, a queen bee can live four years in a hive. That's pretty amazing. You know, It's really not a different yeah, anatomically, it's very different, right? Like, you look at it, and it's, it doesn't have the mouth to feed itself. It, you know, it's got this massive abdomen for just laying eggs all day. It, uh, it's, it can't fly. It's heavy. It's two and a half times the size of these other bees. And the only difference is the shape of the cell. It was, you know, it emerged from its egg in, and, you know, the amount of protein it was given um, to develop, which is pretty cool. Wow, so it's like an environmental circumstance. Yeah. A, a sterile work, so like if a, if a queen bee happens to die or there's some kind of failure or something goes wrong, the, 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 they, they put those queen cells in as a backup plan. It's almost an insurance policy in the event that they have to replace her. If she's not doing her job and they decide to replace her, they'll replace her. Yeah, I think that's good. The question is, if a, if a colony of bees is a form of government, you know, what kind of government would it be? Right? Like, the currency is work, right? The, the, the system works, right? As long as everything, you know, around it works. If the queen's not doing her job, then she doesn't rule the hive. The bees replace her. You know, if the worker bees aren't doing their job, like, they don't work alive, the other bees will replace them. Everybody's sort of like, you know, operating via this currency of, like, productivity. 
and it's pretty cool. They're more productive. These are the hardest working creatures on our farm right here. You met like the farmers and we met like the, me and Amy and all that. We all work hard, but they, we don't even come close to working. This <laughs> These things work. Amy was saying that you had bees from different areas of the world. Is that right? This, these bees are Italian honeybees with Russian queens. And they're, they're a, a Russian Italian cross. Is the function of it or the thought is, and this you ask 10 beekeepers 10 questions, you get 10 different answers, 12 different answers, 20. Uh, the thought on this is we need a bee that's winter hardy, right? We have these long, dark, brutal winters up here. This whole thing's going to be covered in snow in like, you know, 60 days. Um, those, that's the function of the Russian bloodline, right? We want, we want Russian bees because we, we know that they can tolerate cold win winters. Um, and then the Italian bees are just very productive, nonchalant, you know, not too aggressive, easy to get along with, as long as there's stuff to do. Um, the Italian bees we like, their demeanor and their nature. And stuff. Interesting. That's the function. Can we um, see inside them? Yeah, let's do it. We're going to pop one of these open. Um, I'll put on a hat and take a look and see uh, see what's up. This time of summer, and it's time to really get an idea of of uh, of winter winterizing, right? Like we got to get these hives ready for this long, dark, brutal winter. Um, the the hives themselves, those bottom two boxes, those two hive bodies, they they'll hold about 80 pounds of honey uh, to get through the winter. That's what we want to make sure. We're in harvest, so we're pulling these small boxes off as they're, as they're filling up. Uh, we'll pull like 12, 12 or 1,300 pounds of honey this year from the 30, 31 hives. Wow. But this right here, so here's how this works. The anatomy of a beehive. Hive body, hive body, queen excluder. That keeps the queen out of the honey, right? And then bee excluder. When harvest, right now, you basically leapfrog these bee excluders down the line from super to super. You can see the line we gotta do um, to pull frames. These supers, they'll weigh about 60 pounds each. Swing around here. And you can pop a camera right down in here. These bees are going to be happy we're here. You can kind of see how they fill these, these frames out. You just want to soften this up a little bit. You really don't need to, um, you know, do a whole lot. But I'm going to pull one frame out so you can see. Wax, propolis, honey, wood, smoke. These are all like, you know, really common and beautiful elements of, uh, of working a beehive. Yeah, they all smell so so good. Um, looks heavy. I don't... Yeah. Oh man. The frames Amazing. weigh about six pounds when wow. they're capped. Uh, we wait until they're capped fully. Mm. Um, capped fully meaning that that honeycomb look that you're seeing. Yeah, you see it up here. Yeah. That's capped, and oh, this is not capped. yet capped. Got it. So when it's been capped, it's it's sealed and ready to ready to oh, go. Wow. A whole frame, you know, comb like this can last. They found honey still viable in Egypt. You know, honey lasts wow. for, honey lasts forever. Wow. It's perfect pH. That's really a you know, there's no better form of preservation than what mm -hmm. these creatures are able to do. Okay.
my name is Pablo, and uh, this is my microherb house. So I grow 18 varieties total, and um, I want to let you guys try to have a test a little bit. So um, and I want to explain you a little bit too how I grow and uh, how long it takes to uh, grow from germination to harvest. Cool. So, okay, so let's go start this bay, please. So I want to let you guys try, this is the lemongrass right here. Lemongrass, I grow three different lemons. So this one, this is one of them. Thank you. And then this is a special one, like you smash it to, you can release like it. This. This, uh, it's the citrus it. on the lemon. Yeah, you can do the same thing like that. You can squish it. So squish it around and then you smash it on your hand. And then you can smell. And then you can smell oh, it. Wow. It's intense. Yes. That is. It smells so good. And the great. flavor also is different. It's amazing. Wow. So I'm going to let you guys continue here. Um, uh, this is uh, chives. And you can eat it or you can throw it. Yeah. It's really strong yes. on it. Chives. It's also really intense flavor. This is a, like a micro chives. So I want you guys to like to try. Micro chives we grow in different tree <laughs> sizes. This wow. is a micro size also here. This is a mimo size. So most of the chef they like to have the seeds on top. As you can see here, yeah. this is a smaller size we sell. And um, let's go continue a little bit here, please. Yeah. This is a Calvin Pitendros. What is it? Calvin Pitendros. Okay. Cal Calvin. And then we sell. Thank you. Like the stem with the little tiny leaves. Just the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it yeah. has that like amazing, amazing flavor. flavor. Yes. Really and then um, we sell just like a 50 piece for packages like this. And also we sell like the stem with the leaves, but then other growers grow those uh, other uh, pitendros. So I want to let you guys try here. Uh, red ribbon sorrel. This one we sell by pieces. Thank you. I love the color on this. This is so popular around Valentine's Day too, but it's like kind of has that sourness. Oh, like, yes, so it's so good. so yes. The flavor is very intense. Wow. Okay, I want to let you guys continue to the next bay, please. Start with the broccoli. The broccoli, that's my favorite one here, my greenhouse. Wow. This flavor, this is amazing. I mean, it's you, you want to tell me, but that's wow. compared to the. Yes. Yeah, it's so good. Oh my god. I need a whole bowl of it. Oh, yes. It's, it's super tender. So yeah. Yes. And then uh, it's very nutrition -y. Wow. Like, it's amazing. I'm going to show you this. This is a tarragon. I have a unique flavor too, tarragon. I like this one a lot amazing. too. I really don't like, dislike any of them, but. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's so, so good, strong, right? but wow. it's so good. So, so let's go this way, please. So, um, I realize I need to add more of this to my food. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> this is the anise soup. What is it? I need soup. And the flavor is also like wow. it's unique, you know? Very good. Um, I want to let you guys try the lemon balm, so which is different than the lemongrass. And you guys can tell me okay. the flavor, the different of the flavor. Okay. 
I know. It's like a flavor explosion. Yeah. <laughs> it really makes anything flavors. taste good. And the beauty is you can put them on top of like anything. My kids will put them on pizza or like tacos. You can put them on oatmeal. Like eggs are amazing. This is like what lemon candy wished it tasted like. Yeah. Yes. It's so good. Seriously. Lemon balm is so calming wow. too. Yes. yes this it's an amazing herb. Incredible. All the flavors. It's amazing. It's a little strong flavor. Thank this you. Thyme is amazing too. Yes, if you're feeling sick at all, thyme is the way to go. But this is like super potent. Oh yeah. It's like comfort mm -hmm. food flavor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's go continue to the last bit, please. Yeah. Then I can show you uh, one of the number one in the greenhouse. A nutrition seed. Okay. This is the other lemon. This is a lemon basil. So this family of the basils. So this is the, one of the number three lemons I grow here. So you guys tell me the, the difference. Oh, I man. Mean, I think each one has its own, it's you know, unique flavor. I love flavor. that. I feel yes. like I just ate at a super expensive restaurant <laughs> just eating these. Yes. <laughs> that is, that's amazing. That's one of my favorite basils. Okay, let's go continue. Green basil, the most Thank you. typical basil. Strong flavor, right? I can see why you guys have been providing the chefs. Mm -hmm. I get yes, it. That's, that's amazing, right? Yeah. This is the secret. Yes. <laughs> this is opal basil. Opal basil. What is it? Opal. Opal basil. Opal basil, yes. Wow. So it's Four different basils: Thai basil, lemon basil, uh, green basil, and the opal basil. And just oh, yeah, like Judy really was talking different. about, you can see these are like the first couple of leaves that come out on the plant. So it's really just like oh, the seed yeah. sprouts, and it's right. just the first few leaves. And these have only been growing like seven to fourteen days. So the nutrients are super bioavailable because they're not as bound up like by phytates and oxalates and all the different things that can decrease mineral absorption so microgreens are more like bioavailable as well which is really cool and then the last one over here Watercress. Watercress is the number one in my greenhouse. I love watercress. Thank it's you. a lot of nutrition and uh, health. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Well, yes. On the CDC's powerhouse list of fruits and vegetables. Oh, really? Oh. That's amazing. So yes. Most of my crops is taken like uh, for the ammunition to harvest. It's taken in summertime, like uh, let's say. 16 to 20 days and then in winter time is a little bit more longer because it's short days so it's taking like a 20 to 26 days pretty much so, and the broccoli is one of the faster ones it's taken summertime take only like 8 to 10 days and in winter time like a 14 to 16 days so it's amazing And I or guess kills, uh, like flowers, love to so watch the way you made me into a mess. Hands on my dress. They're still really nice quality red. tomatoes, and they are you were everything I didn't need uh, until you left. Taste. They're still really nice quality tomatoes, and they are beautifully. Uh, just they taste great, but we're seeing the difference. And you also don't have the pest pressure over here that you do over there. The pest pressure? Mm -hmm. Pest pressure is down here, mm. and it is over there. 
And these are, you have straw mm -hmm. on top of these and then the black. And that straw came, that straw came from fields that are back there by the cornfield, which is adjacent to us. Wow. So they're growing much more robustly and you have less and the flavor. Pests, and the flavor's better. Yep. The bricks levels are really, are, are up there or through the roof and, and it's just, yeah. The bricks levels? Well, that's your, that's your sugar test levels. Mm. So that's one way that you can test your... I see. It's a way to, but it's not definitive. Have you tested the mineral content? Sarah does that. Okay. And Judith that you met earlier. Yes. Kind of yeah, the that's what they the do. Content. Got but it. The um, bricks looks at like dissolved solids. Okay. So um, the higher the bricks, like the better, like healthier the and squash plants that that stuff that we have on plastic has a mildew consistency faster hmm. okay well I was reading something where manganese and zinc which actually combat viruses as well as we know it, if you increase those at the right ratios and the levels that will actually help combat Downy and powdery mildew. Yeah. But what I'm also seeing is a there's a there's a field down there of melons that there's weeds and everything else that's just grown amongst everything, and the mildew is almost next next to non-existent there. Versus what we know as plastic is restricting that hmm. exchange. Right. How were you saying, what were you saying about the hydroponic tomato growers compared to you guys? So yeah, you got me on <laughs> Hydroponic is, um, it has its value, but you're putting that, you're putting that fertilizer in that plant constantly circulating and there's not much exchange of, mm. of mineral, much exchange of the carbon sources and such. It, it's a, there's a large Ouija uh, complex up the street here. Real large. It's like... Well, and you, have you been here in the winter yet? Yeah, it like... Okay, so me. Leamington. Well, but you can see Leamington, which is due north. Yeah. Because they oh. have so many greenhouses over there. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. Um, that you could literally not use a GPS. You could just take the boat and do it for <laughs> Just follow that. We used to go over there all the time before they closed the borders down. And their marinas over there are like state parks. They're gorgeous. It's just absolutely, it's, like I said, it's only 40 miles across. I was telling her about how we're trying to reduce tillage as there's tillage going on out here. But can you talk a little bit about like tillage and like kind of some of our ideas around that? Well, one of the things we're, we're trying to do is go to a, a, a no-till approach. Um, it's really challenging when we um, are growing so much. Mm -hmm. now, um, every week we're putting a half acre of lettuce in the ground. Um, so it's, it's, it's not like your traditional farmer that's doing 10,000 acres of a product where you can look at it from that viewpoint. Um, we're trying to, we're experimenting with this no-till with tomatoes, with squash, with, um, uh, I'm trying to think of another crop right now, cucumbers and such like that. And we're seeing really nice results. We know that the bacteria, if it's not disturbed, it's going to be, make a plant much healthier. Not, not any different than our gut health. Right. If I choose to drink a bunch of alcohol, I know I'm going to strip. Mm -hmm. good, or if you do mouthwash in your... Mm -hmm. Right. You know... Okay. Come on. So this machine here makes all of our soil. All of the greenhouse soil and all of transplants. So like lettuce, uh, our squash, all the kales, uh, like flowering to such that we transplant outside will start here, okay? Uh, down that first hopper, we have these large skies or pallets of peat moss, and it dumps it into the first hopper, and then the second hopper, we have some pine bark that comes to us from the States, watch behind you. And then the third hopper is empty, and then we have, uh, these two front hoppers have some fertilizer in it. Um, 
everything inside is organic. So in, you see the Fertility Bee has got a little bit of uh, kelp meal, a little bit of biology, and this is mostly lime, mostly lime, okay? Uh, a little bit of humates in there to help the nutrients attach. They fluff, okay, and then the machine that is down right now will shoot it into one of these bays that are across the way, okay? And then what we do from there, and we, we do seven different mixes here. Uh, we have a potting soil mix that you saw at CVI when you saw the beautiful flowers over there, and then what you've been seeing in the greenhouses, all the tray. And we do a winter mix and we do a summer mix. And we'll change up because of drainage and obviously less light. We'll switch those usually October to the winter mix, and then we'll switch tax day around there. It's just kind of a bad date, but hey, <laughs> we do that. But um, pine bark, we have to have aged pine bark. So a lot of the product that we're getting in is over a year old because that's helping to break down. And so that, that will, if it's not real fine, that's actually going to deter from the plant and um, make the, the plant less quality as far as your nutrient value because the nitrogen source will be helping to break down the, the pine bark instead of working within the plant. White bag up top is just perlite. Um, helps with air and it helps with drainage. This is a soil mix that we, I don't know if you met George, but he grows the petite root crop where Saul was. So this soil is a little bit more dense so that the root crop can grow in there really easily, okay? And then has more drainage. And then over here, this is the world famous summer mix and you can see it's a lot less dense okay it'll hold the moisture so we'll scoop that up we'll bring it to this ribbon blender we'll add water and you'll see Catalina and her husband Ramiro and they're filling trays and those are going to have Chinese cabbage, it's going to have mizuna, it's going to have sage, it's going to have everything that you saw in a lot of these greenhouses. And they will be seeded tomorrow morning. So we put a little bit more water in there so that the soil is moist. Hola, Catalina. Hola, Romero. Okay. So then, These are our two seeders. With these machines, we can program with the computer how many seeds are dropped in each one of those ribs. So this is the 20 wheel. The tray will slide across, go in here, and this cylinder will drop whatever seed that we need to be programmed to. Put it there, go down there, they'll throw some vermiculite out to help put moisture to help the germination process, and it'll stack it. Some of them go into a germ chamber that's at a, about a 90 degree, 80 to 90 degree temperature to help the germination process. Some go straight to the greenhouses. But here's a magical moment. So you run us through, you're having these trays come through. And then you see a finished product. So today's a Friday seating. Literally, your, those trays right there were probably seeded today. Hey, I need to go with you. How long do these typically grow before they're harvested? Most of the crops in here are a 12-day, right now, 12-day to 25-day crop. <laughs> and then over in Andreas's house where Saul was, most of those are 10-day crops. Wow, that's a lot of... So the, pro the process yeah. is really cool because they have... The seeding schedule tells us here it is, and they know in 10 days this is how much we're going to have. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. RO system, reverse osmosis. Oh, so wow. we're really working on, with our foyer program, 
and with the greenhouse program, trying to make sure that we're getting good quality water because we know that's extremely important. It's not any different than, you know, us. We, our, I mean, I drink reverse osmosis water. I make sure I have enough minerals that I put in some because I know I'm stripping of everything. But if you took a sample of our water, it's pretty high in chlorine. Yeah. Fluoride, all the stuff that we really don't want in our waters. So that's pretty much the soil building. Questions? Comments? Here comes... What's your uh, production level like over the course of a year? Would you say, like, do you know, have numbers on that? Maybe you're not right. Well, we, we have tray numbers. I could tell you we're roughly, right now, 10,000 trays a week. 10,000 a week? 10,000 a week. And then when we, wow. get, when we get into the holidays, it's going to go even higher. And with the, with the fluoride retention, the mineral retention into the soil, which is a huge issue for us because a lot of cases, if there is going to be bare ground and if you're going to get the rain, a lot of the nutrients, they can go and flush out. But there are several different uh, flowering varieties, such as cucumber blooms, which is one of our top sellers on the farm, also edible flowers. Also, we do grow several different uh, herb varieties. And also, we do have like significant volume of the business is actually coming from microgreens. Now, we were not really sure how familiar are you with, with the microgreens. Sometimes it's kind of like a little bit of more gray area, you know, like for the people, they're not so familiar with that. So we put it up, what do we really include into the, or what do we really understand on the microgreens? Technically, microgreens are new and young plants. When you see them uh, a couple of weeks after the seeding, that is which is going to become as like for microgreens, the first set of leaves which is going to come in up, which is called for cordyledon leaves. They might do have uh, the second set of leaves or partial of the second set of leaves, which is also being called as like for true leaf. What is the benefit of this type of a planting? Number one, the texture is going to be different than like what you would what you would expect as like from a full grown version. It's going to be much more tender. Okay, having said that you're definitely going to get the same flavor what you would expect to be able to get as like from the full grown version of it. So that is going to be kind of like a very nice combination, which a lot of people and a lot of chefs, they, they, they like to go and utilize, and not just chef, even like professional chef, but even like the home chefs, because it is a little bit easier to sell at home, you know, like even I can sell it for the mister, you know, to go and put the microgreens like on the top of the, like on the top of a pasta, or on the top of a sandwich, you know, which is going to make it very, very nice and very easy as like for the application. Also, the second benefit, because technically it is so nice and so tender, it doesn't really require any particular cooking technique, which is going to go and have two benefits. Number one, it's time-saving. Number two, because you're going to be able to go and uh, preserve all of the nutrition, actually, which is located into the plants. It's not going to go and leach out during the, during the different, different kind of healing processes. <clears throat> also, what are we doing over here on the farm? We do provide not just, uh, we do provide a uh, uh, really wide selection of varieties. Which one we do provide it not just as like for different species, different varieties, which is local mate is different, but also we are looking at different life cycles and different stages of the actual plants, which one could go and provide something unique and something different like for the chefs. So this is, for example, over here at Rugla, we do provide it as like micro sizing. We do provide a little bit bigger sizing. It's around like three finger as like height wise. That is what we do call for petite or we can even provide it as like around like four finger height, which is around like ultra. Then we do have the baby size. Then we do have the young sizing. And we actually do have the flowering stage. When you're looking at the plants, the, the texture is going to be different. The flavor can be different. The growing condition, if we do grow it inside or outside, is going to go and determine the texture and the flavor as well. And when you're looking at like the flavor of like the flowering version of the arugula, it's going to be completely different. It's going to have a little bit more sweetness because of the pollen versus, you know, when, when you're picking it as like for a as like for an ultra or a baby sizing, which is going to be nice and peppery and spicy, versus a micro, which is going to be a little bit more toned down. It's going to be a little bit more on the milder side. We do we do the same thing, not just like in terms of uh, greens, but we do we do the same uh, sizing chart as like in, when it comes down to root crops and several other crops. And as I mentioned, we do offer several different uh, nice and unique varieties to be able to go then uh, provide for the chef as much flavors and colors and textures as it is possible. <clears throat> Now, what are we doing, and as like they alluded to it in the presentation, we try to go and do farming. We try to approach farming a little different than, than like uh, uh, traditional agriculture uh, 
uh, techniques are approaching farming. Normally, when you do drive around, especially like in the next uh, month or so in the fields, this is exactly what you're going to be able to see. The big combines, they're going to come back, and you're going to be able to see bare lands, which is going to go and stay, and stay bare through the entire winter time. There is going to be no, there is going to be usually no cover crops. They're going to go and supply a lot of nutrients through the different kind of uh, manufactured uh, uh, fertility forms. What we are, this is what we do call as like for conventional agriculture. What we do over here on the farm, this is what we do call for regenerative agriculture. Why is it different? When you actually drove in with him, you could go and see, like, on some of the lands, we still do have cover crops. We still do have crops, although it is not a cash crop, but we're using it to be able to go and rejuvenate the soil. Why is all of this one important? Because when you're looking at, like, the two different kind of farming techniques, like in a conventional farming, what they have seen, and this is a study which one came out from England, and the study was done between 1940 to 1991, so you're going to be able to see 1940 is always going to be the white line, 1991 is going to be the gray line, and they're going to show, like, the different kind of minerals over here, and you're going to be able to see the different kind of... <clears throat> the different kind of uh, vegetable crops on the top. And what they have seen, they were studying how did the mineral content actually change during conventional agriculture, which one was booming after World War II all the way up to nowadays, okay? And it, it's absolutely astonishing, the findings, because the findings, because what you are going to be able to see Every single mineral with the exception of with the exception of phosphorus, every single mineral level actually went down into the plant level. This this trend, although this is only showing from 19, from 1940 to 1991, this trend hasn't changed. This is actually accelerated. So most cases, what you're finding, like in commercial agriculture, the mineral levels are uh, lesser than than they were actually like in the plants in 1940. Also, in the same study, they were looking at uh, this, the same uh, time frame between 1940 to 1991, the same mineral levels, but they did look at actual like a different kind of protein product, which is even more scarier when you're looking at the numbers. Every single number was actually down. It means the mineral content not just depleted like in a, like in a, a plant level, but is actually depleting into the, into the protein level as well. Uh, and most of these are just about all of these are due to the agricultural technique, which is usually being how, how we are actually, uh, what we are actually applying to go and produce our processes, which is normal cases, just dumping out fertility, dumping out the pesticides and hope for the best. And we are pushing for the bigger, bigger and, and the highest yield as it is possible without putting it into consideration the quality of the plant, the, the, putting into consideration the quality of the land. What are we doing over here? This is what we do call for regenerative, regenerative agriculture. And what we try to do over here, we try to go and do carbon sequestration, <clears throat> which is being done through the photosynthesis of the, of the plant, which is going to go and help for us to go and improve the soil, the soil health, which is going to help for us to improve, improve not just the crop yield, but also like the water uh, 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 conservation into the soil and the nutrient density. Uh, which is going to go then uh, be showing up into the plants. How is all of this one being done? It's a very simple process. Uh, technically, it's being done through the photosynthesis. Technically, what you do have in there, we do have uh, carbon dioxide, which is around like 70, which is around like 21% uh, of carbon dioxide uh, uh, into the air. Then what you're going to have, we are technically gathering the energy of the sunlight, and we are gathering the carbon dioxide. And with the energy of the sunlight, the plant, they can go and capture the, the carbon dioxide with the addition of water, which is usually coming to the soil level. They're going to be able to create sugars, and they're going to be able to create oxygen. Why is this one important? The oxygen is going to go up to the air. Which one is going to go and have for us to be able to maintain the balance between nitrogen and carbon dioxide and, and the oxygen? And the sugars, part of the sugars is going to go and stay within the plants, and they're going to be able to go and uh, treat it as like an energy source. Not a portion of it, they're going to go and feed it to the root level, down to the soil level, to be able to go and feed the beneficial microbes, which one can be fungi, which one can be uh, uh, different kind of microbes, such as like bacteria and so forth, which is going to be able to help for them to be able to go and uh, uh, access all of the minerals from the soil, what they're going to need. Instead of supplying the minerals, just like in a fertility, on a traditional commercial available fertility method, we can go and utilize these microbial lives to be able to go and have for us to be able to go and have the minerals available from the soil for the plants. Why is all of this one important? There's a couple of things. Number one, because uh, to be able to go and uh, pull it out like as much carbon dioxide from the air as it is possible, that's going to go and have with the climate crisis. 
I don't think uh, um, we are hearing anything else besides cl climate crisis, like in the past 10 years or so forth, which is obviously going to be uh, like a bigger, a bigger and bigger of an issue. <clears throat> How are we doing this one? Because we not just have like the cash crop, which one we are producing into the ground, but we do have the cover crops when we would have normally like bare land. And what is what is the cover crop gonna go and do for us? They still gonna go and capture the carbon dioxide, and this they gonna go and pump it back into the soil. It means they gonna be able to we gonna be able to maintain the microbial life into the soil. It means we can go and completely reduce or completely eliminate the different type of uh, commercial fertility. What we what we need to go and put it out there because we do have that. Cycle. And when, when the plants, when the cover crops, they're reaching just about like the blooming stage, that's when they would go and start to feed less into the soil microbial life. Then we just usually turn the cover crops into the soil and we start the cycle all over again. So we try to go and building it up like the mineral content of the soil more like on a natural base. Also, as I mentioned, uh, to be able to go and have the microbial col uh, colony, it is definitely going to go and have with the water retention and with the, with the fertility retention, the mineral retention into the soil, which is a huge issue for us because a lot of cases, if there is going to be bare ground and if you're going to get the rain, a lot of the nutrients, they can go and flush out whatever is excess, they're going to go and run down to the lake. They are so close to the lake and the uh, Security, particularly over here, and it is a huge issue for us to be able to go and deal with the algae bloom, which is largely resulting as like from the phosphate and from the nitrogen runoff from the from the uh, commercial areas. Also, with the water retention, the more we do have the microbial life, the better is it going to go and have for us to be able to go ahead and mitigate any kind of stress, which is which one can coming from either uh, excess of the water or the lack of water. So that is going to that is also going to go and have for us. And also, the more we can go ahead and play with mother nature and more we're going to go then grow the plants according to mother nature versus pushing them for the higher yield and for the faster production, the better is the nutrient density is actually going to be. Now, we actually saw the board and do studies in that back in 2020. That was like, as you have seen, like in a video, that was kind of like a dark time for us, which one <clears throat> had, some, had some upside for us because it did give for us the time to be able to go and focus on and to be able to go and start to understand what we are seeing and why are we seeing the things, what we are seeing in, in terms of like the regenerative agriculture. So what you do have over here, we start to go and do mineral density analysis <clears throat> during a process which is called for ICP inductively, inductively coupled plasma spectrometry. What is this one doing for us? We can technically take any kind of plant and we can go ahead and send it to like a high pressure and a high heat uh, uh, treatment, uh, a microwave digestion treatment, and we can go ahead and put it into uh, uh, into this ICP equipment. And we, when we are adding the supplies such as like argon gas and so forth, then we're going to be able to go ahead and get a reading. So what we have looked at over here, we did look at several different uh, mineral components. Um, and what we have said, we can go and do the readings on ours, but we had to go and come in off of a standard. So we came back and we said, okay, let's go and look at the USD standard revenues. Let's go and use that one as like a standard, like for chaos and whatever they are listing it up. So we are corresponding back to that. Instead of looking at actual values, we said, let's go and look at whatever is the USD listing that is going to be at 100% value. So we're going to be able to go and look at all of the minerals in the same chart. So this particular done, this particular test was done for Lacinado kale and the mesh kale, which is going to be like a blend of uh, uh, our chaos. So what we have done over here, this is the USD standard reference, what USD is reporting. The red line, it was going to be the Lacinado kale, and over here on the bottom, you're going to be able to see like the different kind of mineral contents. The blue line is going to be the mesh kale. Look at the values over here, what we did have. Obviously, not all of them is like super duper high, but there is a couple of them which is absolutely outstanding, such as like the calcium and iron and magnesium and so forth. And also, which one we are extremely proud of it over here, because the sodium, we are trying to go and pull it back very hard, like from our soil, <clears throat> which one <clears throat> which one most cases we are seeing in most of the crops. Obviously every crop is different, so not every crop is re responding in the same way like for the like for the uh, fertility treatments. Some of them are picking up more than others. Also, what we have done over here, we try to go and look at and try to go and test some of our uh, some of our greenhouse varieties. Okay, how are those responding back, and how are they responding back to something what what you normally gonna be able to go and buy, for example, like in a grocery store. This particular test was done in 2020, I believe, around like early December, which is not a prime uh, growing uh, uh, time for us, you know. 
uh, just to be able to go there and look at like the light level. But what we have done, we really grab some Chinese cabbage from the store and we really get some Chinese cabbage from our greenhouses and we have done the same study. Green line is over here, it's gonna be the USD standard. The red line is that is actually which one we have uh, purchased uh, from the grocery store. The blue line is that was our, pro our particular product over here. Look at the numbers. <laughs> And, and we have done not just this particular one, but we have done, uh, we have picked it up materials like from different grocery stores and it was absolutely unbelievable for me to say, like there was a huge difference. So the saying it is, you're gonna get what you pay for. It is absolutely true when it comes down to vegetables and a correlation of the vegetables to the mineral content. Um, now, to be able to understand how our model is working, usually we do harvest everything as like for order. So it means when we do get an order, we usually try to go and ship it out in the same day. Or if we get it overnight, then we're going to go and ship it to the next day. It means it's going to be at the chef's kitchen on the following day. So technically, the product is only going to be one day old. Now, to put... <clears throat> To put this one into perspective, normally when somebody is going to go to the grocery store during the shipping and all of the logistics where the product has to be gone through uh, until it's going to go and reach from the producer to the table, that usually takes around like seven days. So what we have done, we try to go and give a fair assessment and a fair comparison. So what we have done, we did put the same product into the fridge like for seven days and we came back and we retested the same product. So technically the blue line is when you would normally receive it when you're dealing with chef's garden, one day shipping and so forth. The yellow line that is going to be like when, when we set it into the fridge, so we're going to be able to give like the seven day down period. And even when you're looking at like the yellow lines versus for the red one, there is still going to be like a huge difference. Obviously the minerals that is going to be depleting after harvesting, which one we could go and pick it up over here, but even like our seven day old product, it is still going to look much better like when it comes down to the mineral values when you, but versus what you can go and pick it up in a grocery store. Now, what we, what we started with and working to, and, and we didn't really know much about it, and that's kind of like how we get into the picture. When we started to do all of these mineral analysis, we started good and coming to, and we started good and have some understanding that is a, that is a, that is a strong correlation between, between the microbiological level, what is living like in a soil level, and versus the microbiological level, which is living in a human gut. And there is a correlation. And there's a correlation in the varieties, in types, and there is a correlation between the numbers and so forth. And that's kind of like why Amy came along in the picture, because we started to understand maybe our quality is not just due to the practices, what and how we're doing with the fertility, but maybe it is also do how we are developing like the microbiological life into the soil, and half your half your soil is going to be able to go ahead and produce not just a half your plants, but that is also going to go ahead and transport some of the some of these uh, 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 micro. Uh, biological um, uh, community into the into the human gut system, which is half your soil, that is also half your plants, and eventually it's gonna go then, uh, could resort like a good and a half year human gut system, but that is in its territory. So I don't wanna go and get into this because I'm not the expert on that. But that was kind of like, you know, like the evolution, what we have done like in the past two years, and currently we are still looking at, there is a huge correlation between the fertility, what we are putting it out there, and the, not just the quality, what we are putting it out that in terms of fertility, but the quantity and uh, and the plant half and how is it all gonna go and be translated into a half year plant? It can go and resist like different kind of pathogens, different kind of insects, different kind of diseases. And we are looking at how can we go and build all of that one up from the soil within to be able to go and build like a half year plant. So we're gonna be able to go and have less focus on to be able to go and manage outside sources such as like disease and insect and so forth. It's very fascinating. It's absolutely very complex. Uh, but that's, we are kind of like, I'm excited to be able to see the results on the second year of the study because we have put a lot of emphasis on and we are monitoring, you know, like the plant health, we are, we are monitoring like what is the mineral level into the plants and how can we go and put them to the, to the ideal level and how, how are we going to be able to see the impact of that into, into all the way across in the nutrition and, and, and in the pest and insect resistance and so forth. <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. Now, do you have any question? Um, if people wanted to see more of the results of the testing, is that accessible to the public? You know, 
on the on looking at the mineral balance in the plants, mm -hmm. or is there a way I can share it with people? Uh, we probably can go and make it happen. That is a decision what the what uh, Bob needs to go and make the, the CEO. So, um, but I would think normally we do share some of the some of the uh, findings. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah, okay. We can. I think that yep. Would really help. Yeah. Just just let us know what are you interested. I mean, this is just from s some of the slides, like from the very early studies. Obviously, we have yeah. done so much more. Okay. Because cool. okay. yeah, I think a lot of people are like they've heard. I was just talking to Amy about this. They've heard the soils are depleted, but mm -hmm. they don't really know what that yeah. means. They don't have any sort of data or information, really. You yep. know, at least accessible to them, unless they're going to be really nerdy and go on some huge yep. rabbit hole. So it'd be really <coughs> helpful for people to really know because I was on that Napa cabbage. That's staggering. Yeah, and it is really matters, you know, like the like the time of the year. What we have seen, there is obviously there is going to be fluctuation depending on the growing condition, which is going to have a huge influx. Obviously, when we are testing like a kale, like in a peak growing season, you know, like items in a peak growing season, and when we are testing it more like in, which is going to be more like in the summertime versus when we are testing it like like in an off season, like in an October, the mineral levels they're going to change. Also, it is changing based on depending on the sizing of the product. So you know when and you're pulling like, like like the more like what we do call as like for the demi sizing or you know like the when you're pinching like the very top part of the plants they're gonna deafen mineral density versus like the fully grown and that's kind of like how the micros they really do come into the picture because the micros they are so tender they they, they do have the mineral content is can be completely different than like a full grown item okay so there is a lot of factor you know which is gonna go and play into it and that is exactly what we are trying to do with with working with Amy we're trying to go and Map it out how those mineral levels are changing based on the the different kind of sizing and during the course of the growing year to be able to go ahead and see you know and try to go ahead and correspond and get back not just with the fertility what we have added but even like with the growing stage and so forth and with the ideal growing season because I think that is that is going to be really telling for us a story which one we had no really scientific idea about it until now. Cool. I mean, they do that for wine. <laughs> that's how we did it for food you know it's like oh it was a very dry year so the yep. mineral content is this you know yep. yeah yeah and, and it's again i'm kind of good morning i'm kind of glad you brought that one up because they are seeing exactly the same correlation depending on the year if they do have cool. a drier year they right. do have like a higher sugar content totally. or if they do have like a yep yeah, and they're gonna react to it completely different and we're probably gonna be able to see similar similar facets you know because some of the items we can go and track it during the course of the year, especially like on the longer term items. <laughs>